Okay, I'm going to ask you if you would open your Bibles to the second chapter of the book of Acts. And as, as soon as you do so, we're going to look to God in prayer and we'll begin. <coughs> Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you once again this morning for, your, for the opportunity to meet together with the, the saints of God around the Word and be ministered to by the Holy Spirit himself. Your Word tells us that when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. And Lord, we pray now for his ministering in our hearts this day that might we uh, uncover the great truth in Scripture, Lord, and, and uh, uh, much meat to chew upon and feed upon and be strengthened by it. So just bless this time, Lord. And Lord, we pray that we might all be so very conscious that you are in the midst of us. And Lord, we lift up our hearts to you and praise you and thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for our sins. Lord, where would we be without the Lord Jesus Christ and dying on the cross? Just thank and praise you, Lord, for all your blessings towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, in John chapter 16, the 13th verse says, or Jesus said, when uh, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. And um, we're taught, we were talking here about the, la the last couple of weeks, we were talking about dispensations. And another word or, another, or a definition of the word dispensation is administration. And maybe it's a little easier to understand if you think of it as an administration. Think of a presidential administration. You know, we, this, we are living under the Bush administration. On the 20th day of January next year, the Bush administration is going to come to an end and the Obama administration is going to begin. No booing. And, uh, <laughs> And so there will be a change of dispensations, change of administration. Well, this is what we have found throughout the Word of God. And as you recall, there were seven dispensations. The first one is, was innocence. That was Adam and Eve until they sinned. Then God began dealing with the human race through conscience. That administration or dispensation gave way to human government that was at the Tower of Babel. Then we moved on to the next dispensation which was the age of promise. This is where God promised a kingdom and the king. King and kingdom together and the land to Israel. They were his chosen people. They became his chosen people at that time. And the age of promise, or the dispensation of promise, was followed by the age of law. And that's when the Lord Jesus came into the world. The Bible tells us in the book of Galatians that he was born of a woman made under the law. He came in right at the, uh, uh, during the dispensation of the law. Then the next dispensation is the age of grace, which is the church age. And you notice it's in parentheses because it, it was unknown in the Old Testament. It was never even hinted at in the Old Testament. According to Old Testament prophecy, the way it looked was that you would go from the age of law to the kingdom. And the only reason we have the age of grace, the church age today, is because the Jews who were offered the kingdom rejected it. They rejected the king. And so the millennium, which would have been here at Jesus' first coming, was put on hold, and God began dealing with the world today, not through the Jews as he previously had, but in spite of the Jews. So God is dealing with people today in spite of the Jews. They have nothing to do with it. They need Christ as bad as the Gentiles need Christ. And so this is a, a parenthesis in, in the realm of time. Uh, during the age of law, right back here, the age of law, during this time, Jesus is offering to Israel the kingdom. He's presenting himself as king, and he's offering to them the kingdom. And they continuously reject, and so the kingdom is put on hold, and we move along to, um, to, the, to the church age. 
one of these days, the church age is going to end. There's going to be another change in administration. The church age is going to end and the church will be raptured out of here. There'll be seven years of tribulation, but then it's followed by the kingdom. This is when Jesus comes back, the second, comes the second time, his second coming. That'll be to set up his kingdom. Revelation 11:15 15 says, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So these are the, the seven dispensations here. Now, the Bible says that all scripture is, has been written for us. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. However, all scripture was not written to us. You have these various ages or dispensations. And that's why in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the apostle says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to rightly divide the word of truth. Way back in the beginning of the fifth century, Augustine, one of the church fathers, Augustine said, distinguish the ages, meaning the dispensations, distinguish the ages and the scriptures will harmonize. It'll all come together and make sense. When you apply and, and, and study the Word of God, it is, is dispensational truth. All Scripture is written for us, but all Scripture is not, has not been written to us. Well, if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, um, we looked at this last week. I'm going to review it with us uh, again for just a, just a moment here. In chapter 2, verse 16, this is on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is being poured out upon all flesh, and they're prophesying, they're speaking in tongues, and the people there in the streets of Jerusalem are amazed. And in verse 15, they said they must be drunk. But Peter gets up, and in verse 16, he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then starting with verse 17, all the way down through verse 21, he quotes verbatim the second chapter of the book of Joel. Here's what he says, starting with verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. But Peter didn't stop there. He kept right on going, quoting from the second chapter of Joel, verse 19, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. None of that happened from verse 19 on. It all happened up to verse, up and through verse 18. So very obviously between verse 18 and verse 19, there is a gap that exists about 2,000 years so far. Uh, all of that happened up to verse 18, but the rest of it did not happen. Why not? It was because it all hinged on Israel accepting the kingdom, and they rejected the kingdom. And so Peter had no knowledge of this at this point. He had no knowledge of this, so he's just quoting the whole thing. He's, he's go, go, going right along here with what Joel had said. So as late as the second chapter of Acts, there was still no clue about the church. Even though the church was beginning right there in Acts chapter 2, they had no clue concerning the dispensation of the grace of God. Not, not a single clue. Peter is talking here like we're going right on into the tribulation and, and on, on into the kingdom. So, as Augustine said, distinguish the ages and the scriptures will harmonize. And that's why, we, as we read that today, in hindsight is... Uh, 2020. It's perfect. You know, it's like being a Monday morning quarterback. You look at the scripture and you say, wow, all of that happened. And then you get to verse 19 and none of that's happened. That's all still future. Well, that's, that's the reason. Peter had no clue about the dispensation of grace beginning here at this time. Well, Paul says in Ephesians, 
the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation or the administration of the grace of God, which is given me to you, it says you word, that's old English. It's given me, this dispensation of grace is given me for you. And then in Colossians 1.25, he says the same thing. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. He received this revelation personally from God. Now, it wasn't the 12 apostles. It was Paul who received this revelation. Now, this dispensation of the grace of God and the church and all that is, you won't find it in the Old Testament and you won't even find it in the Gospels. And Jesus never taught this. Never. You read all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You won't find Jesus teaching anything about that, this at all. And fourthly, it was not even known by the 12 apostles until uh, in, the, in the early chapters of Acts here. So the dispensation of the grace of God was revealed to Paul, not the 12 apostles. Now the final dispensation, the one after this one, you, you recall, is the kingdom. And the kingdom is also spoken of in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Well, that's a different dispensation than the dispensation of grace. In the dispensation or the administration of the fullness of times, what's going to happen? He's going to gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's every saint of God from Adam and Eve right on through until the very last soul that will be saved during the, during the um, uh, tribulation period. They're gathered together in one. That's the kingdom dispensation. From, and uh, this, this, here, this is what... Um, uh, Joel is writing about here where Peter is quoting him. So we have the two dispensations here in the book of Ephesians, the, the age of grace and the, the kingdom age. Now this kingdom was offered to Israel, but it was rejected by Israel because they would not believe on Jesus and they would not repent. In Matthew 3, 2, John the Baptist is saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is a kingdom message right here. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at, is at hand. They could have had the kingdom right then and there. And then in Matthew chapter 4, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he offers the kingdom to them. And that kingdom offer includes baptism. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. It says they were baptized of him, that's John, they were baptized of him in Jordan, number one, confessing their sins. We don't do that when we baptize people. Can you imagine what a baptismal service would be like? Yo, know, you want to be baptized? Okay, we'll get you up there in the water. Okay, all right, confess all your sins publicly. Wouldn't that be an interesting baptism? You know, we might have good attendance on bap baptismal Sundays. <laughs> oh, boy, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for so-and-so to get baptized. Boy, he's got a lot to tell. <laughs> no, confession of sins, that was kingdom baptism. Secondly, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. In other words, the proof of a changed life. Before you could get baptized, you had to offer proof that your life had been changed. Okay, that's kingdom baptism. And then notice Luke 3.3. 3. He came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. This is not church baptism. We do not baptize people for the remission of sins. Remission of sins takes place when you believe on Jesus. Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And on and on throughout, uh, throughout the epistles. But faith in Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus baptism or Jesus plus anything else. This was kingdom baptism here. And the baptism was for the remission of sins. Not that the waters of baptism washed away sin. 
The blood of Jesus does that. But baptism was a requirement in the kingdom economy. It was a requirement, just like in the Old Testament, circumcision was a requirement for all male Jews. They, they, if they wanted to be saved, they, they uh, you know, if they, they wanted to come and join with the nation of Israel, uh, no, no matter how old they were, they had to be circumcised, okay? That was, that was a requirement. Well, baptism is a require, was a requirement here in the kingdom of uh, economy. And in Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, here's this word, repent again, ye shall all likewise perish. This is Jesus speaking to Israel. And he's telling Israel something very different from which Paul tells the church. He's telling them, hear about the, that the kingdom is at hand. He's telling them they have to repent. He's telling them that they have to publicly confess their sins. He has to, he's telling them that they have to, uh, before they can be baptized, they're going to have to bring forth proof of a changed life and that this baptism is for remission of sins. We don't believe any of that is for the church today. You read from the book of, uh, from the, uh, book of Acts of chapter 10 on, and none of that is connected with baptism. That's kingdom baptism. And so Israel was being called to repentance, and they received three calls to repentance. The first one was from John the Baptist. The second one was from the Lord Jesus himself, and the third one, is, was uh, from Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Now, John the Baptist, notice there in Luke 7, 28, I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. John the Baptist was uh, the first prophet that God raised up to proclaim the kingdom as uh, he was the forerunner of Jesus. God raised him up. And what happened to him? Well, he was imprisoned and they cut his head off. Then the second call to repentance comes from Jesus himself. He tells Israel to repent. And uh, what happens to him? They crucified him. And then the third call to repentance was Stephen in the book of Acts. He, Israel's last chance here now to repent. And what do they do? They stone him to death. So John the Baptist was killed before the cross. Jesus was killed on the cross. And Stephen was killed after the cross. And concerning John the Baptist's death, the Jews permitted it. Concerning Jesus' death, the Jews demanded it. And concerning Stephen's death, the Jews committed it. Jesus had a forerunner by the name of John, John the Baptist. His ministry lasted one year. That's it. And they killed him. Jesus, his ministry lasted three and a half years. And they crucified him. And Stephen's ministry was even less than a year. And they stoned him to death. So John was beheaded. Jesus was crucified. And Stephen, Stephen was uh, stoned. Now, during their ministries, each one ministered concerning the Holy Spirit. During John the Baptist's ministry, they saw the Holy Spirit. We read that in Luke 3.22, the Holy, the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. That was at the baptism of Jesus. They saw, visibly saw, the Holy Spirit in the shape of a dove descending upon Jesus. So during John's ministry, they saw the Holy Spirit. During Jesus' ministry, they blasphemed the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 12, 31, Jesus told them that all blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. He tells them you can blaspheme uh, uh, God or you can blaspheme the, the Son, but he's, and it can be forgiven. But he says there's no forgiveness against the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit during Jesus' ministry. And then during Stephen's ministry, they resisted the Holy Spirit. Acts 7, 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, 
so do ye. So Israel receives here three calls to repentance, three chances for the kingdom, and they reject it all three times. Now, because of this, um, because of this, God gives uh, to the Apostle Paul, calls the Apostle Paul, and he gives to him these, the, this revelation of the, of the grace of God. He, he reveals to him that the, um, uh, he, re he reveals to him that the, the, the dispensation of grace and the gospel of grace and the mystery is to, um, is given to him. It's gonna be a brand new dispensation. Now when Stephen is offering the, the kingdom there to Israel, what does he see, say? Well, in Acts 7, 55 and 56, notice what happens. It says, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing, Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing, here's the second time it says that, standing on the right hand of God. Jesus is not supposed to be standing, he's supposed to be seated at the right hand of God. Why is he standing? He's standing to return. This is the final offer of the kingdom. If they would have accepted it, he would have come back and set up the kingdom. But the final offer was rejected. Stephen is stoned here and Jesus sits back down. In Hebrews chapter 10, read in the 10th chapter of Hebrew, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. Jesus is seated until his return. At his return, he is going to make his enemies his footstool. So Jesus is standing. Stephen sees him standing. They stone Stephen, they reject Christ, and Jesus sits back down. And as we read there in the 110th Psalm, verse one, the Lord, Jehovah, said unto my Lord, Jesus, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And the kingdom was put on hold. And so the dispensation of the grace of God begins with the saving of the apostle Paul. He was the apostle that God chose. Notice in Acts chapter nine and verse six, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise, go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou, thou must do. And in the 20th verse of that chapter, we read straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues. What did he preach about Jesus? That he is the son of God. And so Paul is given, he receives from the Lord, number one, the dispensation of the grace of God. It was given to him to preach. Number two, he receives the gospel of the grace of God. It was given to him to proclaim and preach. And thirdly, he receives the mystery which we'll be talking about at, an, at another time. Now, all of these three were given to the Apostle Paul. All three were revealed to him. None of them were revealed to the 12 apostles. In fact, it was, it was the Apostle Paul that had to go and teach the 12 apostles about the dispensation of grace, about the gospel of grace, and about the mystery. Now, first of all, the dispensation of grace. Here again, here's the two verses we already looked at. Ephesians 3, 2, he says, this dispensation of the grace of God was given to me for you. He says it again, Colossians 1, 25, the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. So God gave it to him. It's a special revelation by God to Paul. Secondly, the gospel of the grace of God was also given to Paul. Before that, they preached the kingdom gospel, the good news of the kingdom, the repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the gospel of the grace of God has, has nothing to do with the kingdom at all. Paul says in Galatians 1, 11 and 12, right there at the bottom of the page, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, the gospel that I'm preaching, this gospel is not after man. 
Number one, it is not after man. It's not a man-made gospel. Number two, I neither received it of man. Nobody told it to me. Number three, neither was I taught it. Well, then how did you get it, Paul? Number four, by the revelation of Jesus Christ, a direct divine revelation. And so this is the, um, the, the revelation here of the, uh, the uh, grace of God, the uh, dispensation of grace, and so forth. And then the mystery, going to the next page. In Ephesians 3, 9, we also read about the mystery. And by the way, the mystery is that Jews and Gentiles are going to come together in one body. Folks, this is unthinkable to the Jews. I'd like you to turn with me. If you still got your Bible open to Acts, turn to the 10th chapter of Acts. Acts chapter 10. And Acts chapter 10 is where God calls Peter, because Peter had the keys of the kingdom. He calls Peter and tells him to go to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. Peter is told to go and tell Cornelius and his household about Jesus. So Peter is not happy about this, and God has to give him a special vision about the, the sheet full of unclean animals. You remember that? You can read about there in Acts 10. And so Peter goes, but he's kind of kicking all the way. But he goes because he's obeying God. He doesn't like it, but he's obeying God. And he goes into the house of Cornelius. And in Acts chapter 10, in verse 28, he's meeting with them. Here's Peter and all these Gentiles in the same house together. In 28, he says, He said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing. In other words, it's contrary to the Old Testament law. It's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew, meaning himself, to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. In other words, a Gentile. He says, this is unlawful. It's contrary to Old Testament law. He says, I, I shouldn't even be in this house. But then the next two words, but God. But God. Okay, something changed here. Something really big changed. But God hath showed me that I should not call, in, call any man common or unclean. Well, according to the Old Testament, the Gentiles were common and unclean. Well, this was the beginning of a new dispensation here. So the mystery is that Jews and Gentiles will be together in one body in Christ. Ephesians 3, 9, it says, to make all men see what is the fellowship. Fellowship? Yeah, fellowship between Jews and Gentiles. Unheard of. The, the Jews consider Gentiles dogs. And they called them goyim, cattle. You know, hated Gentiles. They were unclean. It's, all right, what is the fellowship of the mystery? Here's the mystery. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. He says there's going to be fellowship here when this mystery is revealed, which it was through, through the Apostle Paul. Now, none of these three things the dispensation of grace, the gospel of grace, or the mystery can be found in Old Testament prophecy because the prophets didn't preach it. None of, them can, none of those three things can be found in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because Jesus didn't preach it. And none of these th three things can be found in the first 12 chapters of Acts because Peter didn't preach it. It was given to Paul, and Paul had to instruct them. And when it was taught to, to Peter by the Apostle Paul, he, he learned it. And if you notice in 2 Peter 1.12 there, he says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. It wasn't just enough for Paul to teach Peter and the others. They had to be established in the present truth. And Peter, Peter listened to Paul. He knew that this was a message from God. And so what happens here is God inserts between the age of law and the kingdom age, he inserts a previously unknown, a brand new dispensation, the church age or the age of grace or the dispensation of grace, however you want to call it. Now, let me give you proof of that. Now, we just saw in Acts chapter 2 
where Peter is quoting from Joel. And he goes right on from the pouring out of the Holy Spirit right through the tribulation and into the kingdom without stopping. He sees no gap in between of which the, the church is. Okay, now in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. All right. Unto us a child is born. That's Bethlehem. That's the birth of Jesus. It's a prophecy of Jesus. He says, unto us a child is born. That happened during the age of law. Jesus came, he was born during the age of law. All right, the next line says, unto us a son is given. That's Calvary, that's where Jesus was given. For God so loved the world, he gave. What did he give? He gave his only begotten son. Unto us a son is given. That also happened during the age of law. And then the next, the next part of that uh, verse says, the government shall be upon his shoulder. That has never happened yet. That's the kingdom. So you read this in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, and you see the, uh, going right from the uh, age of law to, to the kingdom age. The church totally unknown. Born in Bethlehem, given at Calvary, the government will be upon his shoulders. Law and kingdom. Now you go to Daniel chapter 9, and we looked at this passage last week also. In Daniel chapter 9, he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, make an end of sin. And number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. All of that happened at Jesus' first coming. Those three things happened during the age of law. And that verse goes right on and says, number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. And number six, to anoint the most holy. That is the kingdom. And there's no gap in between. That's all one verse. So in the Old Testament, they couldn't see the church. It, there's no church in prophecy at all. Take Micah 5.2. Here's another prophecy of the kingdom. We read, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth, Unto me, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he fulfilled prophecy, he shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. He was born in Bethlehem during the age of law, he's going to be a ruler during the kingdom age. You read that verse and there's no gap in between there, that, because the church was totally unknown during that time. So this is why it was such a surprise for Peter and the other 12 apostles. Here comes this upstart, Paul. God saves him, and he, uh, in, instead of uh, the 12 instructing Paul, he has to go and instruct them because he has been given by special divine revelation, revelation of the dispensation of grace, the gospel of grace, and the mystery. They knew absolutely nothing about it. You could study the Old Testament till the cows come home and you won't find a hint of any of those three things in the, um, in the Old Testament there. So this was a confusing thing for Peter. It really was. In Zechariah chapter 9, we have another example of it. Zechariah 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He's just and having salvation and so forth, riding upon the, the foal of an ass. This takes place during the age of law. In fact, it was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 21. All right? But the next verse in Zechariah, the 10th verse says, well, I will cut off the chariots from Ephraim and the horses from Jerusalem and the battle, shall, uh, the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace of the heathen. And then it says, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea, even from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the kingdom. And you read that, that prophecy there. And here you have uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, meek and lowly having salvation, riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass, and next thing you see, he's king. And he's, his dominion is from sea to sea. Not a hint of a church age in between there at all. Now you can go through all these Old Testament prophecies that way, and you won't find the slightest smidgen of a hint that there's going to be an age of grace or a church age or anything. So this is why it's so hard for Peter. Well, Peter accepted it, but he had a hard time 
understanding it. Notice 2 Peter 3, right in the middle of the page there, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. He says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, Peter considered Paul a beloved brother, our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now Peter is writing to Jews. His epistles are to the Jews, to the 12 tribes. And he says, Paul has written unto you. He's obviously talking there about the book of Hebrews. That's the only writing that Paul, that we know of, uh, that wrote to Jews, exclusively to Jews, okay? He says, he's written unto you. Then it goes on and says, as also in all his epistles, that's all 13 other epistles that he wrote, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood. <laughs> some things that are hard to be understood. This is Peter 30 years later after he's been instructed in the grace of God. He accepts it, but he says there's some things in there for us Jews. He says it's hard to be understood. You know, um, my wife and I went out west this, summer, this past summer and we got one of those uh, GPS units. You plug it in, put it on your dashboard and it talks to you. It tells you everything to do. It tells you how you're supposed to go, where you're supposed to go, tells you when you do something wrong. <laughs> you know, you know those things all got a woman's voice. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why they have <laughs> kind of like a wife or a backseat driver telling you, <laughs> talking to you the whole trip. But when that thing, if you do something it don't like. Like, for instance, you pull off to get gas or, or uh, um, get something to eat or make a stop someplace. It starts talking to you, going wrong, going wrong, you know, go back. And you don't do it because, hey, i got to get gas. It's right up here. And so then it says, recalculating, recalculating. <laughs> if there were GPS units back in Peter's day, <laughs> that would be saying to Peter, recalculating, recalculating here. Peter... <laughs> Peter is having such a hard time with this, even 30 years later. He says, Paul's a beloved brother, but he wrote things that are hard to understand. Because Paul had to convert Peter and the other apostles from kingdom preachers into grace preachers. And so um, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus had already said unto Peter way back, there he said, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now converted means turned around. Doesn't, you know, we use converted for salvation. And that's, that's true, There's nothing wrong with that. But converted doesn't necessarily mean he got saved. He got converted, he got turned around. And who turned him around? Well, um, it, had to, it, it was given to the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, I went up by revelation, which means God sent him to the 12 apostles in Jerusalem. He, he received a revelation. Go to those 12 apostles and communicated unto them that gospel. That's the gospel of the grace of God, which I preach amongst the Gentiles. He says, but privately to them which were of reputation, the 12 apostles, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. And they received him. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 through 9, they saw that the gospel of the circum uncircumcision was committed to me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So it goes on and says they, they uh, uh, gave him the right hand of fellowship and they said, we'll, you go to the, to the heathen, to the Gentiles, and, and we'll keep on uh, we'll keep on uh, going, going to, the, uh, uh, to the Jews. So uh, Jesus had prophesied unto Peter that he was going to be converted, and it was Paul that converted him. He turned him around. So Peter had to recalculate here, because what he had learned from Jesus is now uh, it was kingdom truth, and, and that was set aside. And so then he, uh, he has to learn for, from Paul, him and the other 12. Now, Jesus had told the twelve, when he was here on earth, he had told the twelve about his death, burial, and resurrection. 
He had done that. Luke, he did that, well, he did that more than once, but in Luke 18, verse 31 and through 33, it says, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. What things are that? He shall be delivered to the Gentiles, Old Testament prophecy. He shall be mocked, Old Testament prophecy, spitefully entreated and spitted on, Old Testament prophecy. They shall scourge him, Old Testament prophecy, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Well, that last part kind of threw them. They're going to put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. The twelve could not comprehend this, that this was going to happen to Jesus. They believed he was their coming king, and they preached it. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he tells them this, he's going to be put to death, and the third day he's going to rise again. And look at the next verse, verse 34 says, they understood none of these things. Secondly, this saying was hid from them. Thirdly, neither knew they the things which are spoken. They could not comprehend the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't it strange that when God gave to Paul the, the gospel of the grace of God, the very heart of that gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that which the, which the twelve could not comprehend at all. Here's another example uh, in Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. How did Peter react to this? Next verse, verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. It's bad enough in Luke 18, they understood not these things. It was hid from them and they knew not the things that were spoken. But now Peter actually rebukes Jesus. He said, no, you're not going to be killed. You're not, you're not going to have to die. You're not going to uh, have to rise the third day again. And that's where Peter rebukes him and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now this is what Peter meant when he said, wrote 30 years later in, in 2 Peter, Paul wrote some things that are hard to be understood. When Jesus told him about his death, burial, and resurrection, he had no clue about it at all. It wasn't until the, age, the, the kingdom age had been rejected and postponed and the dispensation of the grace of God began, only then did Peter kind of reluctantly finally uh, come to an acceptance of it. So um, in 1 Corinthians, chapter 15 here is the gospel of the grace of god given to paul christ died for our sins he was buried he rose again the third day that's the gospel that's that's the gospel three points christ died for our sins he was buried and he rose again the third day that's that's the gospel message and the 12 could not understand this they, they totally failed to understand it as they, because they had been proclaiming the kingdom. Now they have to preach in this present dispensation after they were instructed by the Apostle Paul about the grace of God. Now here's poor Peter. And this is where God's GPS unit is, is ministering to him. Number one, he's born during the dispensation of the law. So he learns the law, okay? He knew the finer points of the law. Secondly, he's called by Jesus to be a disciple to preach and teach about the kingdom. Recalculating, recalculating law, age of law truth. He's got to learn now kingdom truth, okay? And Jesus is rejected. And so then he is converted into a grace preacher during the dispensation of grace. Recalculating, recalculating. Here he's, he's it's recalculating again. He's got, he's got to learn about the grace of God. And he does, and he calls it present truth there in, in 2 Peter. And so um, um, Peter, he, he goes through a little bit here. He finally becomes a grace preacher. The first time is in Acts 
15, 11, very first time, he says, but we believe, he's telling this to the whole Jewish church at Jerusalem. This is all the, the big wigs are all there. This is a church council. And he says, we believe that through the grace, here he is, he's preaching the grace of God, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, that's us Jews, we shall be saved, how? Even as they, the Gentiles. He says, Jews and Gentiles are all going to get saved the same way by the grace of God. That's the first time Peter preaches about the grace of God. The last time he talked about the grace of God was just before he died in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. He says, grow in grace. Grow in grace. And for the previous 30 years, Peter had been growing in grace. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. So the grace of God, grace of course means undeserved favor. The source of grace is the Lord Jesus Christ. John 1.14 says he is full of grace and truth. John 1.17 he says grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Secondly, this grace was given by Jesus to the Apostle Paul. Ephesians 3, 8, unto me who am less than the least of saints is this grace given. And then in Acts uh, chapter 9 tells about Paul, how he got saved there. Thirdly, this was given to Paul as the dispensation of the grace of God, Ephesians 3, 2, the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. He says, none of these things move me, neither account I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Not the kingdom gospel, but the gospel of the grace of God. And then fourthly, we're justified by that grace. Romans 3.24, just being justified freely by his grace. We're not justified under the law. Um, the, the law cannot justify. We are justified by, uh, by faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We're not justified by the law. We're justified by grace. We are not justified by works. We're justified by grace. And we're not justified by kingdom truth. That's not for us, that's for the Jews. We're justified by the grace of God. And so he says in, in Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Romans 11.6, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Can't have works and grace can't be trusting in both. It's either you're going to trust in works or you're going to trust in grace. And if you're trusting in works, you'll never get there But because not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, Titus 3.5. Um, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, Ephesians 2.8. So we see uh, we're justified, uh, uh, not justified by the law and not justified by the teaching of the kingdom. We are, number five there says, we are not under the law, nor kingdom truth, but under grace. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace, the grace of God. We're called by grace. Galatians 1, 6, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you, into the gr grace of Christ unto another gospel. In Galatians 1.15, he says, When it pleased God who separated, separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Ephesians 2.8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. We're saved by grace. 2 Corinthians 6.1, We have received his grace. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. And finally, number nine, we are expected to grow in grace. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of him. So this is the dispensation of the grace of God 
previously unknown, unthought of, not even dreamed about, not even hinted at in the Old Testament. Next week, we're going to begin with the gospel of the grace of God. And we're going to see the special revelation that Paul received concerning that gospel. We saw a number of verses uh, the last couple of weeks about the dispensation of grace. Now we're going to see the gospel of grace. Let's look to God in prayer and we'll close. Heavenly Father, we thank you now that you have given to us the word. And Lord, we have to sometimes agree with Peter that Paul wrote some things that are hard to be understood. And Lord, we, we need your Holy Spirit to te be our teacher, to teach us these things and that we might learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And Heavenly Father, Lord, as we uh, get deeper into this, the study of the grace of God, the, the age of grace, the gospel of grace, Lord, we pray uh, that we just may appreciate the grace of God more and more. That it was not of works of righteousness that saved us, it was your grace, the grace of God. Lord, it was undeserved. We are nothing but hopeless, lost sinners. Nothing good about us, but yet you reached down and loved us and saved us. And we just thank you for your, for your eternal, everlasting grace. Oh Lord, we pray that you would, uh, your blessing would rest upon us as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.